Have you ever wondered how you can follow Jesus and not just be a fanatic? That's what we'll talk about today. If I'm holy to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, I must forsake everything that is contrary to him. Aiden Wilson Tozer. Today we're going to talk about a book, which I call a tough book, but it is about how we can be a follower of Jesus. I think sometimes we wonder if we're doing the right thing. We wonder if we have that relationship with Jesus we're trying to get. And I read this book a few years ago, and it is one of two books, I think, that completely knocked me off my feet. The other one is Crazy Love, but this one also is such a profound book about how we love Jesus and how we follow Jesus. This book is called Not a Fan, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus by Kyle Eidelman. This book is great because it it makes you think. The one thing I want to lay out here before we even get started is, of course, we are saved by Jesus. The work is done by him. The question is now, what can we do to draw closer to Jesus? We know that salvation is in his hand, but that doesn't mean that our life and the way we live our life and the way we rule our brains is something we should just disregard. Well, I'm paid for. It's over with. I don't even have to think about it. But Jesus is a loving God, and he wants the best for us. He wants us to follow him, which is the best for us. Kyle's a pastor, and he talks about the people who just show up for Christmas and Easter, calls them creasters. I used to remember that people would say that some people only go to church when they want something thrown at them. Water, rice, soil. Think about that. That's kind of deep. But the idea is that we're only really going to church on the big high points. It's not a part of our life, and the message of God is something that we do on a Sunday, maybe, and it's just something we do every once in a while. And a lot of times we want to know, what is Jesus going to do for us? And oftentimes when we live that kind of a Christian life, we wonder if something's more, if there's something out there that we're missing, if there's a relationship people are having with Jesus, hey, we're not having. And even the other way, when we talk to other people about Jesus, we're almost begging them, buy this car, believe in Jesus. And it's almost because we think Jesus is desperate. We are doing it for Jesus. Please believe in Jesus. He wants you back home. And of course he does. But the question is, are we actually trying to make a sale or are we trying to make a follower? And he says that there's a lot of people who are fans of Jesus. You know, they have the ringtones, the t-shirts, and he says he's one of them. But if the heaven and hell and eternity comes down to one question, it's got to take it seriously. And we have to know that Jesus is the fundamentally most important thing in our lives. And somehow if we tell people that are, we're also witnessing to that this is a tough message, maybe they'll just walk away. We just want to get them in the door. And then once we get them in the door, then we can start talking tough messages. But really, we want to have a relationship with Jesus. He gives this comparison of when boys date and they're scared to death, and I remember this very well, of what he calls the DTR talk, which is find the relationship. I, you know, I know I hated that. And primarily it was because, and I'm going to blame the guys here, they won't talk about what they want or where this is going. So you're dating a guy and it seems to be going okay, and you're getting along. And it could go on like this forever. So at some point, me being a girl, I would say to the guy, so where do you see this relationship going to? Of course, he thinks that's the most petrifying conversation of all and that boys and men try to avoid it as much as they can. But then are we asking that question with Jesus? Is he coming to us and saying, look, you seem involved. You seem interested. Where's this relationship going? And even so, he talks about how many Christians are very enthusiastic. And I know it's true. You know, you see a lot of people who are very good at professing Jesus, 
And sadly, sometimes those people end up in the news. Are they really professing Jesus to portray an image? Or are they just a sinner like all of us who screws up and makes a mistake? Because I like history and I see all these kings and queens and all these people who profess faith in Jesus Christ and then end up doing the most horrific things, it makes me wonder in the end, was Jesus a shield for them or a ploy or something that they knew they had to do in order to rein in people? So not only is the relationship with where do we stand, but, you know, we think about where people who are admirers stand talks about them as being fans. You know, we see people who love Taylor Swift and they know all the things about Taylor Swift and they know all the concerts she's going to give. And he says, when you look up that much details about a person without that relationship, you're kind of a stalker. You're kind of someone who's sort of creepy instead of trying to build that relationship. And he says, oftentimes too, in our marriages, we're sitting there and trying to convince our spouse that we're better than the other person. Honey, did you see I made you this amazing meal? Did you see that I ordered your favorite game for you so it'd be here when you got done with work on Friday? And we try to show it, not sometimes because we're so in love and so attached to someone, but sometimes because we're trying to prove we're a really great spouse. It's really about taking that step to become a follower. You know, same thing in your marriage. You want someone who's committed to you, not someone who's just doing things so they look like a really good husband. Mentions Nicodemus, and I think Nicodemus is such an interesting character. Even it struck me more so for whatever reason when I was watching The Chosen. He's so interested in what Jesus is doing, and he's starting to see that I come and do all these things, and Jesus does it better. And he comes to Jesus at nighttime. He doesn't want anyone to see him. He wants to make that commitment to Jesus, but he does it as long as it doesn't cost him anything. And at some point when the Sanhedrin, which is the 75 religious men who were in charge of the temple, were trying to figure out what to do about Jesus. And Nicodemus puts in a very weak argument. Well, you know, maybe we should just go check him out and figure out what's going on over there. And then they start saying, oh, are you from Galilee too? I mean, I come from the backwaters of the United States in a place where, I don't know, people sometimes think poorly of. And so I get it when you say something like, and people thought of Galilee this way, nothing good comes from Galilee. Nothing good comes from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. What's up there? Just a bunch of trees and bears and stuff like that. And so if someone came to you and said, hey, you know, uh, We see Jill over there. She's doing X, Y, and Z. And someone stands up and say, what, are you like one of those hicks up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan too? You know, it's it's derogatory. They were trying to tear him down. And Nicodemus, until the very end, wanted to have that faith in Jesus, but he couldn't bring himself to follow Jesus. Gives an example, and I think of this too, is that where you're trying to work out at the gym, But I know that when I used to go to the gym, and now I'm doing better because I'm trying really hard. But you go to the gym, and then you would sit on the exercise bike for a while, and you'd watch TV. And then you'd maybe slowly walk on the treadmill. And you could be running, or you could do something a little bit more. But you're going to the gym. You're going through the motions, but you're not doing the thing it would take to actually build muscle. And that's what he sees we're doing with Jesus and faith, too. We try to talk about Jesus like we're selling a car. We're trying to show everyone the features. Did you see the heated seats? Did you see the amazing steering wheel? Look how nice the view is. But instead, Jesus wants to be more than that. And we worry that if we tell people that Jesus will interfere with your life, they're going to walk away. You know, who wants to be interfered with? He wants us to give our lives to him. And Jesus doesn't want to be honored just with our lips. He doesn't want that relationship with him to cost nothing. He looks for that intimacy, that closeness, that relationship. And when it gets hard, sometimes we walk away. 
I became a Christian. My family was atheist. My dad never spoke to me after I told him I was becoming a Christian. And I was worried my mom would do the same. Gratefully, she did not. But it was a way that was going to help my family go. But it was a thing that could have just left me without family entirely. And so people don't like it. They also don't like it when you're committed to Jesus, when you do things for Jesus, when you go on mission trips and then think you're just pushing a little too far. I know the last thing that my dad said to me when I became a Christian is, is don't let it interfere with your life or don't let it change you or something to that extent. And how do you become a Christian if you don't let it change you? But instead, Jesus wants us to show him our hearts. He wants us to be excited. He wants us to show him that love that we could have for him. And a lot of times, if you probably notice, the Bible talks about our relationship with God as a marriage. You know, we're the bridegroom, the church is the bridegroom. And a lot of times when people are talked about idolatry, it's um, like betraying a love. It's betraying a spouse. And, you know, Hosea had to marry a prostitute because that was what his people were doing. They were being seen as marrying prostitutes by turning to other gods. And so when we start going the wrong direction, it is as if a spouse was seeing someone else, dating someone else, in love with someone else. And it is painful and hurtful. And we have to realize that he loved us first. He loves us in this way, this way of true dedication. And we have to love him back. But what if it costs us everything? It could, and it might. And we do a good job. We go to church, we tithe, we say the right things. Maybe we, he says sometimes we have the right haircut. But are we really giving everything to Jesus? He said that a lot of times when you go to a Christian school, it doesn't start with Christ. It starts with, with rules, like you're going to have this hair, you're going to wear these clothes, you're going to do these things. These are our rules. But instead, it doesn't talk about the inside. And so a lot of people walk away from the Christian church thinking that these outside rules are what Christianity is about. You have to have short hair. You have to dress very nicely. You have to look very streamlined like everybody else. And you have to get an eight to five job. You know, it's not what Christianity is about at all. It's inside out. It is from inside our guts. And then we look at the rules, we look at the liturgy, we fight about this and we fight about that, but this is not what the church is about. We also look at the rules entirely differently. And I think when it comes to, you know, the ways that Jesus wants us to live, we look at those wrongly. We say, oh, well, the church is trying to tell me this. They tell me I can't divorce my spouse, or they tell me I can't live with my boyfriend, or they tell me I have to do this with my money or that with our money. And we resent it because it's rules. But when we are in love, the rules are different. We do the rules because we love that person. It's just like, again, he talks about marriage. that We don't do the things that irks our spouse because we know it hurts them or it upsets them. We do things that we know the love to see. And we do it because of love. And that's where the rules of Jesus really have to be. God has called us to live a certain kind of life. And that love, if we can find it, will help us to live the life because we love Jesus. I always have these images of Jesus from various stories, like where he's knocking at the door and no one is answering. Or he is watching people like Peter deny him. It must be heartbreaking. And so even when I look around at the world and the news and the wars and all the things, I just think, gosh, this must just be heartbreaking because he wanted us to have heaven on earth. He wanted us to have this amazing place and what we've done to it. So if we look at Jesus with love, we will want to do the things he wants us to do. But we don't get there by doing it one day a week. We don't get there by watering it down. We try instead to see to bring the Holy Spirit in. He mentions um, Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade, who had this breathing technique. And when he would sin, he would breathe out. 
which is interesting technique because it's also how you relax. But then he would breathe in and think of being filled with the Holy Spirit to help prevent him from doing that sin again. God wants us to stand firm. He doesn't want us to live a watered-down life. And he says, too, that you think about it in terms of marriage or life, where someone says, I want to have a great marriage, and then they take a job where they're working all the time. Or they say that they want to lose weight, and yet they're eating all the wrong things. I used to work in a building that had a cancer clinic, and 90% of the people I saw walk out of this treatment area immediately lit up a cigarette the moment they got out of the building. We try to do the right things, and either because we don't believe it or we just can't ask the Holy Spirit for faith or we're trying not to tackle it because we really love doing it, we don't do it. But then you think about James 17, without actions, our faith is dead. It's not meaning that we're not saved, but we want to have a living faith, something that was capable of driving out demons, that was capable of showing the world the love of Jesus. We want to have that relationship with Jesus that we know he is on our side and that we feel it in our hearts. But he says, I don't want you to be lukewarm. He said that once someone came to him and said, well, my son joined your church and he's just going too far. He's doing too many things. Can you just tell him to ease up a bit and be moderate? And it's like, Jesus is not moderate. He told you to deny everything. And deny means almost to remove the existence of the thing from your life. That we have to believe, but we also have to follow, which means action. He doesn't want us to just live this Sunday, you go to church life. He wants us to be in our souls and in our hearts every day and every moment. He doesn't want us to hide. And he says we get scared because we're afraid that we're not worthy. We've screwed up too many times. And, you know, if we don't think we can do what Jesus is asking, why should we even bother? But instead, Jesus says, take up the cross and follow me. He would walk up to Matthew, who turned away from his born occupation. His real name is Levi. And that name indicates that he came from a family of priests. He had an occupation. How do you end up a tax collector? Jesus says, follow me. Talks to Mary, follow me. He talks to Simon Peter, follow me. Become fishermen of men. He wanted people to drop everything and follow him. And we can do what he wants us to do and love, and make Jesus the great love of our life. I always think, too, you know, people always wonder, well, the church just wants your money. Jesus doesn't need your money. He wants you to give of yourself. It's always that big debate about the rich ruler who asked Jesus, how may I be saved? And Jesus said, give up your money and follow me. It wasn't about money. It was about what this individual loved more than anything. And what's the one thing that you love more than anything? That's hard for you to give up. At one point, I was invited to go to Malawi and teach people about how to use computers so that they could use computers to um, have an income. And I thought about leaving my friends. Can't leave my friends. Not for a whole summer. Go to Malawi? And so I turned it down. Is that the thing in me that I'm just unwilling to give up is my friends, even for just a summer? And he says, even in America, we have a little bit different way. We've turned Jesus into a store, Church Incorporated, I think, you know, where we're trying to sell people on Jesus and we're trying to get more. And even in our own lives, more, more, more. And let's bring more people in. And Jesus didn't count people. Instead, he made people go with their hearts. He reached people by their hearts. And those people, including Paul, said that they chose slavery over freedom because of Jesus. So in the end, this book is just thought-provoking 
because it's talking about honest, real love with Jesus. How can we bring ourselves to that point with that relationship with Jesus where we know we have made ourselves slaves, we have made ourselves the bride, where we have committed everything to Jesus, and where we're not just trying to sell Jesus, but we're trying to show the love that Jesus has for everybody, including ourselves. Where can we take that commitment? He says in the end it's really important that he does believe, absolutely, and and I do too, that grace is found at the feet of Jesus. He is the one who saves us. This is not about salvation. This is about believing and following in Jesus. And as the book says, not being a fan. Rest assured your salvation is safe. But what can you do to stop being a fan where we're looking up all his stats and all his details and his internet movie database website, but instead bringing in that loving relationship that's been compared to the love of a spouse. All right, so my challenge to you is think about that thing that if you were the rich ruler and you walked up to Jesus and Jesus says, you have to drop whatever, whatever thing you love most, what would that thing be? And I'm not telling you to go out there and drop that thing, but realize that that thing may have too high of a rank in your life and that Jesus needs to be the number one thing you have. Can that thing be put back into a proper place where you would actually not walk away from Jesus and be sad because Jesus asked you to give it up and then put Jesus back in that number one spot? All right, everyone, thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always send prayer requests to me, jill at smallstepswithgod.com. I will pray for you. And if there's any topic or anything that you're interested in hearing about or a book you think is really interesting, just let me know. And remember that putting Jesus in the number one spot in our life, our love in our life, starts with small steps. Small steps.